Burzin chess, what was the reaction? This is. There is something hiding inside Earth, but it's not a nutshell. Yeah. Uh, so, this is new Kuzgazat video, and I guess he's uh, going to talk about inside of uh, Earth in detail. I hope it's in detail. Uh, this is a different topic. I don't think I've watched a video from Kuzgazat about something like this, so it's going to be really interesting. I don't know if I know much about that, really, like basic stuff, but yeah. So, for me, this is going to be really interesting and informative. Uh, so, yeah, let's watch this one. We've found a new planet, home to octillions of the most extreme beings living in the most absurd and deadly hellscape. In absolute darkness, crushed by the weight of mountains, starved of oxygen, cooked alive, bathed in acid, salt or radiation. And yet, they live for thousands, perhaps millions of years. It turns out, this planet is not in space, it's inside the crust of Earth. This is the deep biosphere. And we basically learned that it exists yesterday. Its volume is at least twice as large as all the Earth's oceans, home to more microbes than the rest of the entire planet. Their total biomass is more than 20 times greater than all humans, livestock and animal wildlife. Let's descend into this mad, deadly world where none of the rules we thought are mandatory for life apply. Going deeper and deeper, Deep life seems to be everywhere we look, below the oceans, near volcanoes, beneath the glaciers of Antarctica. I mean, it's mandatory, a lot of things, uh, the way how life is on Earth. But we know, like, life when you, like, kind of, like, crack through how life works, like, there, there can be extreme scenarios where life can thrive, but we just never find that much of it. There have been some scenarios here and there, right like we always assume like radiations like a life killer but yeah like something like tardigrades and things like that can uh you know absorb radiation even like from space so yeah so the, the many scenarios where that we think of is probably like uh you know where life can thrive could be scenario where like other form of life can survive this is one of the things i think about like in space we are looking for life in like this goldilocks zone and sure that ap applies but if there are like different form of life, non-DNA based on different things, right? Like they could be very different. And like where we assume or oh, life surely can survive there, that, you know, there could be life there, right? So eventually I think we will like broaden our like range where we look for life. But right now our resources are so small and like, uh, you know, there's so many planets out there. So it's like, you know, right now we're just looking at the Goldilocks zones and things like that. But yeah, I'm pretty sure there's plans, right? To look for even broader picture. Under any landscape we can imagine, and anywhere we live. We'll use a special duck science drill and start our journey in familiar territory. On land, in the soil, where plants grow and animals roam. If Earth were an onion, this is the very top of the very top layer. Soil is a lavish four-way partnership of air, water, minerals and organic matter bathed in endless energy. Life lives in luxury here. Plants exploit this paradise and produce more than 30 times the biomass of all of Earth's animals each year in a constant cycle of growth and decay. Only a tiny fraction of the biomass is buried deeper in the ground, supplying juicy resources for almost half a billion years. As we dig deeper, most of the air has been squeezed out and we cross the water table into a zone saturated with groundwater, rich in minerals and some organic matter. Roots from the most ambitious plants reach down here, and the most common inhabitants are scavengers living off decay. This layer can be pretty cold because it's still slowly warming up from the most recent ice age. We reach bedrock, a foundation of solid rock for all the less solid stuff above, home to fractures filled with water. It can be exposed to the surface or buried hundreds of meters below stuff. Here in the dense bedrock, we're in a weird planet inside the planet, the most thrilling zone of the deep biosphere. As we drill further down, temperatures gradually begin to rise and soon it gets really hot and the pressure rises. Underneath 400 meters of rock, the pressure is similar to the surface of Venus. We drill faster now, down to 1,000 meters, deeper than the Burj Khalifa is tall. It's about yeah, by the surface of Venus, like uh, when, you know, like Russia, Russia? Well, yeah, Soviet Union. 
uh, pretty sure that's yeah so when they you know like launched a lot of things like the, the footage and things shows you like how bending effect there is right like you would think oh wait a minute is that a lensing effect not really like uh, the, you know like it's, it's that's the level of pressure there is that even the images look bent so that's the level of pressure he's talking about uh, you know Venus's surface uh, you know like pressure is insane right uh, you know Venus's atmosphere is so hard it can like cook a pizza high temperature pizza right and on top of that pressure and just like yeah it's just insane about 30 degrees Celsius and there's almost no free oxygen left we continue and finally stop almost four kilometers down above us pressing solid rock weighing tens of thousands of tons with pressures as intense as at the bottom of the Mariana Trench. Down here, it's on average 120 degrees Celsius, even hotter if a magma plume is nearby. The heat is a leftover from Earth's formation and from the decay of radioactive elements like thorium and uranium that shower the crust with a constant wave of radioactivity. To make things worse, some rocks are mixed with extreme amounts of salt. Hell. And yet, life is thriving inside rock. If we zoom in, we see that solid rock is not actually solid. It's traversed by cracks, voids, and tiny pores. Sandstone, limestone, or basalt are so porous that up to 40% of their volume is actually empty space. But even much denser rocks like granite can be split open by cracks and fractures. We've found a gigantic planet-spanning system of micro-caves, free real estate filled with water and hardcore microbes. And these caves are moving. Just like the atmosphere is constantly mixing air to create weather, down here rocks are mixing to create rock weather. Submerged mountain ranges are shifting and ripping, crashing and merging. Continents smash into each other with the energy of millions of nuclear weapons, but as slow as your fingernails grow. Countless tiny and not so tiny earthquakes rip open tiny new fissures and passageways, creating new spaces for life and closing others off forever. In this hot, moving pressure cooker, minerals are forged and baked, and organic molecules are created and destroyed. An insane menu for anyone brave enough to try to survive down here. Let's venture into the system of tiny caves and meet some of them. The most ex- Whoa, that level of pressure, that, that kind of environment of life is still thriving. Uh, so obviously life needs water, earth life at least. So. But even in that kind of an insane environment, right, where that kind of activity is happening, somehow life is still surviving. This is one of the reasons, uh, you know, to think like, surely life must exist somewhere else. Because everywhere we look here, life is insanely resilient. Life always finds a way to like thrive somehow. If you look at our records, like as soon as life could have existed, it did on Earth, right? Everything cooled down and it just become like, uh, okay, this is the environment where any life can form. It did whenever we check the records, right? It didn't take time or something like that. As soon as like conditions were right, life's, life popped up, right? So if it's that easy, not easy. If it's that like uh, resilient and like that fast and it just like happens like that as soon as there's like chance to happen, surely there must be life everywhere, right? So it feels like, you know, the, the more space becomes accessible with, with like reusable, you know, rockets and things, SpaceX and everybody else apart from NASA and like more people are joining space, you know, race and space things. Uh, you know, a few decades from now when uh, it becomes more accessible with people like, you know, like explore space, explore places. I'm pretty sure we'll soon realize that, like, oh, wait a minute, like, even the microbial life is, like, thriving everywhere. Extreme living things. We think that octillions of microbes live down here, and naturally they are pretty hardcore. The doomsday preppers of the underworld. Some have big, bulky genomes living entirely on their own, basically forming their own ecosystem. Like the bacterium Diesel Foridus Audax Viata. It synthesizes its own food by nibbling carbon or sulfur from the rock and turning it into organic substances. If the conditions get too extreme or if there's no food around, it kills itself to survive by forming an endospore. It divides into a big and a small part and swallows the small part again, forming a cell within a cell. The outer cell then sheds its water and kills itself, leaving the spore to float around, maybe for thousands of years, until it finds a good place to spring to life again. Others like some company, like the Archaea, with the clunky name Altiarchaeum hamiconexum, that have a rare double membrane covered in weird materials that protect them against the extremes. 
They shoot out nano-sized grappling hooks to tether themselves and seem to live in cracks and fissures filled with water completely devoid of oxygen, harvest carbon dioxide to create biomass and may sort of eat hydrogen. The conditions in the deep biosphere are so harsh that other microbes share the hard work by forming consortia. They knit themselves together in a biofilm, a very thin, sticky net that shields them against the extremes. They are miniature cells, often with a small genome, but each good at one thing. One type of microbe eats methane and excretes its electrons. A second type eats these electrons and converts sulfate into sulfite that's then eaten by a third microbe, and so on. Some eat iron, others use electrons to turn nitrogen or carbon dioxide into biomass. Life down here found ways to use stuff that's poisonous to most animals to make food and energy. Oh my god, that surprises me. That kind of an ecosystem microbes have created. Everybody, uh, you know, like helps each other in that way, right? Dependent on each other. Man, the complexity is awesome, man. When was this, like he said, like we just discovered this, like when just, it's like very recent thing. Like somebody drilled down there and realized that. But yeah, this is insane. Like, you know, there were people who were like trying to drill to the center of the earth or whatever, right? And like stopped even Soviet times and other times. I'm pretty sure I watched a real life lore video about it, right? So yeah, if they had successfully did that somehow, we would have discovered a lot of shit back then, right? You know, like it would be scientifically awesome in a way. Obviously, like other problems aside, for scientists, that would have been awesome, like finding all this shit. But still, life is incredibly hard, and resources and energy are super hard to come by. So the most intense strategy for survival down here is to live forever. Like monks who've taken a vow of poverty, deep microbes consume very little and conserve their energy. Their metabolism is up to a million times slower than microbes at the surface. They had a meal when you were born and are still digesting it. For most of their life, they exist in a slow limbo. Some even slowly cannibalize themselves until a sudden influx of resources arrives by pure chance and then they spring into action and reproduce. With this lifestyle, it seems that extreme microbes can live for centuries, maybe even for millions of years. If they're not hunted to death, of course. Because kilometers deep in limestone habitats, there seem to be spaces big enough for multicellular predators. We've found asexual worms, 100 times longer than microbes, hunting and devouring bacteria. It's not clear if they originated down here or if many earthquakes opened up fractures for water to carry them into the deep. But there are other fierce predators like rotifers or arthropods in the depths hunting immortal microbes. We wish we could tell you more insane things about life in the deep biosphere, but there's a problem. We don't know that much yet. For one, we can't really get a good look under kilometers of rock. I was surprised, like, all the information that was coming in, like, damn, like, how did they research so much? But yeah, obviously, there's going to be limitations there. Multicellular life, like, that's something, right? I mean, must have, like, leaked down from the water, but uh, obviously, more research is, like, going to be awesome here. Like, where did they come from? Like, uh, how is all working? This whole new area opened up for people to like really, you know, like delve into it, like how it's all working. And who knows how that's gonna like uh, lead to like uh, where the life came from. Like th all this will basically peel off the question like how did life begin, how life works and things. So yeah, it's interesting. Drilling down could contaminate the samples with microbes from the surface. We found living ones in deep mines and brought them into the lab. But it's pretty hard to simulate the conditions they feel comfy in, in boiling hot water, squeezed under mountains, submerged in deadly chemicals, and still see them through a microscope. And the microbes live so slowly, for so long, that nothing might happen. A lot of what we know about them we got from turning them into a slurry and looking at what their genes could do, like breathing nitrogen or eating methane. We know that the diversity of life in the deep biosphere must be staggering and that some of the most hardcore and extreme beings live down there. This is a proper frontier of science, super hard to study, and most of what we know we've learned in just the last 20 years. There is so much more. Yeah, yeah we don't want to turn this into some kind of horror movie, by the way. Bring something from down there, it turns out some kind of a deadly virus and it killed most of the humans. Pom, pom, pom. Some kind of a movie scenario is right there. So I'm sure people are being careful. <laughs> there'll be some like the, oh by the way we were researching that we brought something like way down there and just like it's too deadly to humans apparently there you go or 
undiscovered mystery for us that could bring us progress in medicine, energy, the climate, and more. Let's end by moving our gaze from the inside to the outside again. Since we now know how extremely large the deep biosphere is and how life down there survives without light, oxygen, sane temperatures, or not being covered in poison, could there be deep biospheres all over the universe? Maybe all you need is a planet or moon with internal heat or radiation and a chemical composition that allows microbes to build the parts they need. Some scientists suggest there could be 10 of them in the solar system hiding beneath a seemingly dead and frozen... Yeah, Enceladus, that's, uh, you know, like, chances are really good there, right? Yeah, Europa, there's that. There must be something there, right? There has to be something there. S ...suggest there could be 10 of them in the solar system hiding beneath a seemingly dead and frozen surface. So as we learn more and more about the life below our feet, we may accidentally learn about life in the universe. That's how it works. You're lucky. Yeah, well, go to kiwico.com for us because that and support the channel. Go to the original video page link. But yeah, yeah, that's how it all works, right? When when we're trying to discover something and like accidentally, it's not an accident, that's how science works, but we, we suddenly discover something that leads to like a larger picture of understanding, right? But something like that is not happening that much nowadays, like, because like, you know, the fundamental things that you can like discover on the table is like done and gone. What we need to discover and understand now is like much bigger uh, challenges, right? Uh, things that require like particle accelerators, like big ones and like uh, even more uh, ridiculous things like, you know, looking into like deep crust of the earth and things like that. But yeah, so sooner we, we're going to realize like, you know, like more and more things like this and it will create a broader picture. But yeah, right, well, that was, that is something hiding inside the other version of the nutshell. If you like my next one, don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you next time.